Uh, today, I told our panelists our goal today is to have us almost witness a conversation among the three of them. So I'm going to moderate, but my goal is for this to feel as close to the breakfast we just had, sort of getting acquainted with each other, so you can get a peek into how these guys would talk to each other about their challenges. Um, so we're going to talk for a little while, and then I'll open it up to questions from the audience. So let's, uh, let's rock and roll. All right, let me start with each of you. I told you I would ask you each this question, topic being Darwinism. What is the biggest change in each of your industries that you're facing? Just let's go down the line and talk about that for a minute, and then we'll start the conversation. What's your, you know, your evolutionary change that you have to keep up with? Yeah, I think for, for us, so I'm obviously in the garment industry, the retail apparel industry. For us, it's really the, the wake-up call of what is happening with the responsibility we have as a huge manufacturer of a lot of products that customers buy and wear and what happens with the end of life of that product all the way through production to the end of life. And the reality is this industry is, creates a tremendous amount of waste, uses a lot of energy, and needs to be completely reimagined. Um, otherwise, we're going to face an existential crisis. Uh, we are at a point where it is, you know, we all know what's happening with climate change, um, and it is time that leaders really step up and use their business and their platform as a force for change and positive impact. So that is, for us, one of the many things facing us, obviously the impact on society, um, building stronger communities, building the awareness of what we need to do as leaders, but really reimagining the entire uh, process in how consumers can buy products that are much more responsible for the environment and for society at large. Okay, great. We're going to come back and ask a lot of questions, but Tom, what's your big change? Yeah, I'd, I'd note a, a series of revolutions going on right now. One, I think, is a technology revolution. The, the way we think about make, move, and sell energy is changing dramatically based on a variety of technology breakthroughs and, frankly, behavior patterns on our customers. I think the second is a business model revolution. Per, as a result of all this technology, this 100-year-old business model that has been centered on energy production in America is really going to change, and you can't keep the waves of change off the beach. And so we've got to figure out a way not to respond, but lean in and influence and really make a difference here. An environmental revolution, where now we're talking in a very open, clear way about what we should do about carbon on the planet. And what implications does that have for fuel stocks? And what implications does that have for, again, personal behavior? And then finally, a cultural revolution. So when you think about the kind of people that are going to lead this change, they are not ne necessarily the same people that have gotten us to where we are. Southern Company is an iconic company, one of always, I think, one of America's most admired, and we've been so successful for so long. But I think one of the challenges we face is that one of the greatest harbingers of future failure is, in fact, past success. So... How do we reinvent ourselves? I always like to talk about this concept of creative destruction. When you've been doing a kind of business for so long and somebody comes along and says, nope, no matter how successful you have been, we are going to change it, that is threatening. Building that revolutionary spirit in a culture is something that we've got to do. All right, we're coming back to that as well. A lot there to unpack. Jeff, your biggest change. Yeah, so a lot of what Tom said resonates with me, but for us, the biggest change is that there's been a lot of change in food. I mean, the, the, the words dynamic in the food industry would not have gone together um, 10 or 15 years ago because it was, a, it was a very static industry for about four decades. But what's changed over the last 10 years has been people's food values, and, you know, and we've had to adjust to that. So, for example, 20 years ago, General Mills didn't produce any uh, or sell any organic food. Now that we're the second largest producer of natural and organic food in the country, and number one if you include blue buffalo, which is a natural organic pet food. <clears throat> What's going to change over the next five to ten years is really how food is delivered, and especially with the change in technology and how food is delivered from stores or warehouses to people's homes. That's going to be the next biggest change in the next decade. And so. As the, the key for us as a 150-year-old company is to make sure we keep what's been successful about our company and our values, but also then migrate the things that need to change, and it's not always easy. The question for any of you, do you think the pace of change, required change, Darwinistically so to stay ahead, is faster than it used to be? 
or is yes. it just we talk about it more? Yeah, you know what, though? I, I, I love the framework of Darwinism. However, I, I like to put a more optimistic aspect on that, okay. right? I mean, we're talking about survival in case of Darwinism. Right. Adaptation to be successful, to create an aspiration that will make the planet better, to make you know, our way of life better is really kind of what we're after. And I think one of the political kind of seasons that we're in is the rise of populism. And I think so often now, so many people are losing faith in the institutions of government, the people that run them. They start to distrust iconic companies and big institutional structures. What we have to do in this time of change is reach people where they are and define our success by their success and make sure that the communities are better off because we're there. Create a positive aspiration. I prefer to think of it that way rather than survival. <laughs> well, the strong, strong survival, I guess you can look it up that way, to the be one of the strong. Fit. One thing I was uh, curious about with all three of you is you've all been with your organizations for a relatively long amount of time, and you all come from relatively established old line organizations are old, been around for a long time, but yet you're change agents, your leaders as change agents. How do you do that? It's very hard to have come from a system, to be part of a culture, to be identified with the culture, and still be an effective change agent. How do you each do that in your own organizations? Well, I think, you know, I've worked for Gap for 26 years, and I've run Athleta for six years. Gap acquired Athleta. Uh, 10 years ago, and so my perspective was always, you know, I love to be the entrepreneur inside the big company thinking way ahead in terms of where do we need to go, what do we need to be, and making sure that we are leading in a way that is very tied to where values are going, society is going, the environmental needs are going, and connecting that back to how you lead with values. Um, and I think one of the things that's always a challenge is you may see things way ahead of when others can see things and connect those dots. And you may run into naysayers that might not see things at the same time you do. But it's very important to have that conviction and to be able to figure out what is the right team I need to surround myself with? How do I stay and create that and stay with that very important North Star and start to build the proof points um, through action, through actually creating programs and, and ways of action that are leading you where you need to get to. Um, and by proving that that is a path to success, um, you really create incredible influence. So one of the things for us is uh, we became a certified B Corp 18 months ago. Will you explain what that is for people who may not know? Yeah, so a B Corp is, uh, is when you go through, a, it's a very rigorous certification process that you go through through a company called B Labs that goes through the certification with you. And what it is, is it's the highest level and most rigorous standards of ethical performance around social responsibility, environmental responsibility um, for private and public companies. And the idea of a B Corp is that your business should be used as a force for good and that profit and planet and people all can work positively together. They're not in conflict. We were acting as a B Corp in Athleta before we became a B Corp. We decided to become a B Corp because we wanted to uh, make sure that we had that rigorous certification and we wanted to stay a B Corp and be recertified every year. Uh, and we also share the message of why that is important because there is a lot of greenwashing out there where companies might say they're doing something but they're actually not acting in the way that what they say. And so B Corp certification, we believe, will be to business what, as an example of what certified organic is to the food industry. So it's a way for customers to understand and uh, you know, stakeholders to understand that this is real. These are very, very high levels of standards that this company is adhered to. So for us, it was about really believing in creating very, very aggressive sustainability goals. I talked earlier about the garment industry and, and its impact on the environment. So five years ago, less than 5% of our products were sustainable. We put a goal out to, by the end of the next year, 80% of our products will be sustainable. And that's through fabric manufacturing, fiber recycled and alternative fibers that are sustainable. And that is, that is a very, very ambitious goal. It's unprecedented at our scale. 
And so acting and, and getting the right innovation together and, and emphasis and energy around reaching that goal has been really important and sharing that message, leading with purpose, leading with values. Customers care about this more and more and we're finding every year customers are moving more and more towards voting to support brands that are leading with values like this. And so, our, and our business has been incredibly successful. We've quadrupled our business in the last six years. And so showing that, that proof point helps influence the company, the greater company, we've, we've done a lot to influence a much more aggressive path of sustainability for Gap Inc. Um, and that, that is, was always our intention, and not only to be a proof point out there for the industry, but a proof point within our, within our company to be able to move the needle much faster. And it is easier when you're smaller. You are more nimble. Right. But you can be that, that, that proof point, and you can move fast, and you can show what's possible. <laughs> is part of your unspoken or even spoken mandate to be a disruptor of Gap? You know, to, to... I would say change maker. Okay. You know, it's really <laughs> I, you know, influencer. We want to influence through demonstrating success, not just talking about it. but So they're not just ideas, they're actions, and connecting the dots between leading with values, leading with purpose, you know, creating really strong, bold values and how that, why that's good for business and why that's good for communities and stakeholders. And Gap Inc. has always been a very strong value-based culture, um, creating very important programs all over the world, uh, you know, to help youth earn their first jobs through retail internship programs, through programs we have with our factories in Asia where we build life skill training programs for the workers that are primarily women through a PACE program. And we've also been you know, moving in the right direction with sustainability and responsibility, but we are pushing it that much further to be able to create greater change and greater influence. Further and faster. I Further come and back, faster. I want to come back and talk about what's hard about what you've just yeah. done. Yeah. Um, but Tom, I want to ask you, I was surprised to learn that yeah. you were, went from 75% coal to 20 Talk about the mix of things you're doing for someone who has an old school notion of what Southern Company is and does. Yeah, look, before I became chairman, we were 70% of our energy came from coal, single digits from natural gas. And today we're around 26 from coal, uh, about 48% from natural gas. We're the only company still building new nuclear. But here's the thing, I, this notion of inventing the future is really the key. We're transforming, making, moving, and selling energy. But part of transforming it is not just living in the present tense. We've got to think about proactively uh, staying with technology innovation. We're the only company in our industry that does proprietary robust research and development. The keys to the future are gonna be unlocking the promise of energy storage and also dealing with the carbon atom. Uh, we can't turn our backs on a lot of the hydrocarbons in America, but we do have to deal with the atom. We run the nation's carbon capture research center. We run the international carbon capture research center. And we're rethinking the whole model of miniaturizing what has been in the past, this kind of age of big iron, gigantic power stations, giant transmission lines, and all kinds of big infrastructure. We're miniaturizing that, and now we are creating a business that as the age of big iron starts to dissipate, we are building, I think, a capability to put make, move, and sell on the premises and under the control of our customers. That's fascinating stuff. The, the one thing I do want to point out is, from a cultural standpoint, this is very threatening stuff. We've been so successful for so long, and so many people at Southern, we have the lowest prices, the highest customer satisfaction, and the highest level of reliability. And why the heck do they need to change? Well, if you did a pie chart of people at Southern Company, you'd have this giant slice of make, move, and sell, and they're very credible, and this tiny little slice of the revolutionaries. And these are the people that ask why and why not, and why can't we do it this way? And the people in the rest of the pie slice want to assassinate the people in the revolutionary <laughs> slice. When I got this job, I knew I had this job about a year before I had it. And I went to our corporate shrink. Now you look at me and say, they've got a corporate shrink. But anyway, <laughs> you would say, give me out of our 150 so officers, give me the 25 or so that are the revolutionaries, the guys that can really adopt and run with change. Well, sure enough, this guy comes back with the 25 people and I went, there is no way that guy or that woman 
is a revolutionary. And what they have done is adapted their behavior to fit in. What we've got to do is celebrate the revolutionaries, create a safe space for people to question the iconic behaviors that have taken us so long. And the very first day when I did take over, created this little line, honor the past, build for the future. And we've done lots of stuff I could talk about later. I want to come back and talk about that with you because I'm really curious how you culture, how you foster a culture of revolutionaries when there's a strong immune system, right, that exists. Could I, could I build on a couple of yes. things that have been mentioned already as well as a question you asked a couple minutes ago? And that the, the first is you asked about, about change and is it just talked about or is it yeah. is the pace of change changing? First of all, there, there, there's no question that people talk about change a lot, but the pace of change has accelerated in almost every industry over the last 10 years, and it's going to accelerate again. And so um, while change is difficult, the idea of staying the same, um, it might be easier in the short run, but in the long run, it'll leave you non-existent. And so there's no question that the pace of change, certainly in our industry, and I think most, most industries, are, it's going to pick up. Um, and I, what I would tell you about you know, leading, leading change, it's really hard. I mean, it's really hard. And um, it's really hard for the people for whom change is done too, and it's really hard for the people who are leading the change. And you know, what, what is required, I think the first thing is conviction. And Nancy mentioned that. You have to believe in the, the change that you're making and the organization that you're leading. And the, for General Mills, we believe that big is a force for good, or at least that it can be, and that we believe that we are. If I didn't believe that, you know, trying to make change at a company that's been around and successful for 150 years would be a tall order. So the first thing, you really have to have, you have, to have conviction. The second is you have to set the expectation, and, and uh, we talked about that here a minute ago. In the very first meeting I had with our global officer team, and we had never gotten a global officer team together. I've been the CEO for two years. About a month after we, I became CEO, I got the group together. My very, first, my very first words to the teams were, we are gonna transform General Mills. And because, and you're like, well, how exactly are we going to do that? I don't exactly know, but I know that we're going to. I know that we're going to do that. And so, the second thing I think is the key is to make sure that you're setting expectations. The third, I would say, is that you're never going to be perfect. Any change journey, you're going to have setbacks. You're going to have some wins. You need to celebrate those. You're going to have some. You're going to have some things that don't work at all. You need to be honest about those, and you need to make sure that you keep changing because perfection is the enemy of change. And anything, anytime you see a dynamic environment, you show me a company that's perfect, I'll show you one that's not changing fast enough. And for us, that's been particularly difficult. For a company that's been wildly successful, like Tom's has been over, you know, over 100 years, that's, you know, that's really tough. And then, you know, I guess, finally, I would say you've got to find the right leaders, and you talked about that. And what you find is that there are a lot of leaders who can adapt to change, and they're really able to rise to the challenge. There's some who aren't. And some of those people aren't able to adapt to change. They're really good people. They're really smart. They've really helped the company to get where they're going to go, but they're not going to help the company get to where they're going to go before. That's the hardest part because a lot of these people, when you come from the inside, they're your friends. You've seen their kids grow up, right. and that's hard. And so you need to bring, there, there are people you need to bring in from the outside with differential skills. So you know, the, this whole leading change, it's really, it's really interesting and sexy to talk about. I can tell you from leading it, it's gratifying once you're successful, but the road, <laughs> the road to get there is... Uh, you know, it's got a lot of landmines. Yeah, I tell you, this idea of being a change agent leader requires, as you said, vision and courage. And I guarantee you, we find ourselves in a leadership position where there is no consensus behind us. And therefore, what you must do is build the right talent, build the right relentless communication internally and externally to create a following, to get people to adopt what they think is risky behavior. We know, you just said, doing nothing is the riskiest thing you can do. Getting momentum, creating the ability to act, react, modify, get back on course, that's the right way to go, just as you said. Yeah. You both talked about just the, creating the culture of risk taking, I think psychological safety is so important on teams because if you say you want innovation but you don't allow for safe places for crazy ideas to come out, then you squash those ideas. And so that psychological safety and making sure that you create a very inclusive environment where it doesn't matter like where the idea comes from. I talk a lot about this with my teams that I don't want a top down leadership hierarchical environment. That's not our culture. Our culture is a great idea can come from anywhere. As leaders, you have to recognize the potential of that idea. And for you know, you said as well, sometimes you don't you have no idea how it's gonna work. We had no idea how we were gonna get to 80%, but you get the right leaders in the room and who are passionate about it, 
and move, I look at my role as I've got to clear the obstacles for them to be able to just get that idea out. The issue here is not one that stays within the company as well. So let's just take a simple case. We shut down a coal plant somewhere, Putnam County, Georgia, plant branch, take it out. That plant represented about 20% of that county's revenues, its tax base. The jobs at that plant were roughly double the income level of what's available elsewhere in that county. What do you say to the teachers and the firemen and the police when you take those steps? This must be a holistic approach. It isn't just us. It isn't the boardroom. It isn't your management council room. It isn't the company cafeteria or auditorium. We have got to be inextricably intertwined with the communities we serve and provide a pathway, a bridge, for everybody to do as well as they can during these times of change. You've all talked about how your strategy really is now connected to communities in a way that feels far beyond a nice annual report, you know, noting the things that you've done. Could you each talk a little bit about the, the I'd say, extraordinary efforts you've done in the communities that you work in and serve that might be surprising to people how involved you are? Maybe yeah. start with you, Jeff, yeah. Yeah, for us, I mean, I think the, the first key is that we need to make sure we focus on the, the places where we can really make an impact because there are so many demands placed on, on companies and CEOs these days. If you, if you try to answer that call for everything, yeah. you end up doing nothing well. So for us, as a food company, we really focus on food security and uh, reducing food waste. I mean, we, we, we took out 4,000, 4, 4, sorry, 4 billion pounds uh, of food waste this this past year, and uh, we're really proud of that because How'd when you we do it? How'd you do it? Yeah, we did it. We did it because we we did it in a way that partners with others. Because anytime you want to create change, you're not going to do it by yourself. It really takes a coalition of the willing and people with different skills. And so for us, we did that by partnering with Google to create an app that connects people who have food that's about to be wasted with with people who need food. So people like Feeding America and General Mills was a founding sponsor of Feeding America. And so by creating that app, you create that connection. So we did it. We provided the funding. We provided the funding to cr help create that app. We had the technical expertise from a company who would be way better at that than we do. We connected them with people who have food, and so we're able to reduce waste. And what that does is it, it gives people access to food who really need it. It also reduces the amount of food that's going into landfills because it, tr it creates a tremendous amount of methane gas, which in turn, you know, heats up the environment. And so, so we're, we, we've been a big f supporter of reducing food waste. We do a lot re with regenerative agriculture, and there's probably an hour-long discussion on that. Just but to define it briefly for people, regenerative well, agriculture. Regenerative agriculture is really basically taking care of the soil, which we farm on. And, and the, the reason why that's important is that in the last 50 years, about half of the topsoil in the U.S. has gone away, and in the next 50 years, the other half will go away if we don't do something different. And the outcome we're looking for is, is sustained soil. And the way we do that is with things like cover crops and rotating crops. And the benefit then is that we sequester carbon in the soil, which reduces greenhouse gases. We also sequester water. So it, it, uh, in times of drought um, or in times of heavy rain, the, the crops are more resilient. And the ultimate outcome has to be for farmers to be more profitable. And uh, the way we do that is working with groups like the Nature Conservancy, as well as, as groups who, who teach farmers. And we, we, don't, we don't teach the farmers themselves. We, we provide the funding to people who are really good at that. And so again, it requires partnership. You don't own any farms, right? These are just your suppliers, effectively. We don't own any yeah. farms, yeah. But, but you know, we don't own any farms, so they're really our suppliers. But a lot of things we do, for example, I said we're the second largest natural and organic company. One of the things we do for with, with dairy, for example, we bridge farms from traditional dairy to organic dairy because there's a three-year period, it take, about a three-year period it takes to get from a conventional dairy to organic. And in between there, sometimes you can't use that milk, but we have both organic yogurt and we have a yogurt that's not organic. So we can actually help farmers bridge that gap right. and, um, and it's, it's in, in a really meaningful way. We think uh, about leadership in this regard in really three levels. One is responsibility for self, making sure that you're as good as you can be and today is going to be better than yesterday and tomorrow is going to be better than today and making sure that you spread that around. Responsibility for self. Second is responsibility for team, making us, Southern Company, as good as we can be. But I think the salient point here is responsibility for the enterprise. The enterprise is something bigger than who you are. It is beyond your parochial interests. It's not Southern Company, it's the industry. It's not the industry, it's Amer American commerce. It's something bigger. At Plant Branch, it's the community around Putnam County, Georgia, making sure that we're all better off because we're there. To be a citizen 
wherever we serve. We do that in a variety of tangible ways. An example. Locally, what we have done at Georgia Power Company, for example, is hired a team of ex-principals. And what they do is work within the state in the education system to make sure that the, the coursework and the, the process and the nurturing and the after-school opportunities for students is as good as it possibly can be and is modernized and is effective. We now fund our own schools. We have our own academies. You know, there's this big issue in America right now where everybody wants to get a college education. Well, we recognize that a really valuable, important part of the workforce is skilled labor. So we fund our own academies to train people to be linemen, to work in a plant, to really be valuable and earn six-figure incomes at very important work in America. On my level, I tend to project nationally, so I take a... Uh, a, a leadership role in things like national security, cybersecurity, physical security. Uh, when big storms hit the United States, I help lead the response from a multi-regional assistance aspect to make sure that the communities are restored not only with electricity but with hope. Working with the government, uh, walking the halls of Congress. Whatever we can do to make the big playing field better helps us all. Great, Nancy. So we have um, several things we do. Um, first, we give paid time off to all employees to work in the communities on, with the nonprofits organization that each individual employee is passionate about. That's do they very have to important. Check it with you first. Is there nope, any? They, they can just take say, the time I'm off. doing my time yep. off to do this. And then we match donations. So that's number one. Just employee, what what areas are they passionate about? Where do they want to get involved? You know, hundreds of thousands of hours. Um, each, each year are given directly by our community involvement through employees. The second thing we do specifically with Athleta, and then I'll talk about some Gap Inc. programs, is we have 200, almost 200 stores across the U.S. We believe very strongly that the community that we have with our customers in helping to support health and wellness for women and girls is critical. So free yoga classes, we do events, we do girls confidence training workshops in our stores, we host classes on the latest wellness information, whether it's food, nutrition, uh, fitness, and those are all open and free. And that's very important, that relationship that we have with our customer versus just thinking about it as a transaction. It's much deeper than that. And then there are two programs that are very, very important that are that are run by Gap Inc. And the first one is called This Way Ahead. And that is where we have a responsibility in areas where there is marginalized youth to be able to use our stores as a place where this can become the first job. And to be able to give work skilled training resources to youth that may not otherwise have that opportunity. Um, and, and it's been incredibly successful, and it's a program that we're growing and scaling across all of our brands to, to be able to bring you know, the paid internship program, first job, first paycheck, learn how to build relationships, learn how to be responsible with your time, um, and build engagement. The retention is really, really high with these students that come in. So that's powerful. And then the fourth thing is the women that make our, the people that make our clothes in other countries, most of them are women. 80% of garment workers are women. And many of these women are in developing countries that do not have access to education or skills. And so we've created a program called PACE, which is an eight-week program that takes these women through basic life skills training, everything from personal hygiene to financial skills to conflict management. And it's been phenomenally successful. 300,000 women have gone through PACE and we have the goal in the next couple of years to have a million women go through the PACE program. We're able to scale that, thank you. <laughs> we're able to scale that because we're bringing more partners in to help us do that. And now it's, it's global and we're working with NGOs and other companies too because it is a powerfully a successful program. And so I think that's back to you have to take responsibility for different communities in which you're a part of. Um, Athleta also works with fair trade. So we're building the fair trade movement in the garment uh, industry and building that. And fair trade offers a, an additional premium to workers, which the factories 
match, and the workers decide what they want to do with that extra premium. So teaching them how to save money and earn um, additional wages is also very important. I think what you're hearing here is a, a differentiation between the what's and the how's. You know, you make clothes, you make food, I make energy. Um, that's our what, make, move, and sell. However, the hows, our behaviors, not only within the company, but with our external publics, are really arguably the most powerful things we do. When you think about Darwinism, what is sustaining? We know that there are sine waves, there are ebbs and flows of the what's over time. Certain trends happen in the food industry and in the clothing industry, and you can't predict fashion over time and look at the transition in energy. But I'm telling you, the most important thing we can do as leaders of the enterprise now is to touch somebody's heart in a very profound way. I think business has a very unique opportunity right now. As I mentioned before, where people are getting disillusioned and, and, and as a matter of politics, we are divisive. I think we as leaders of the enterprise can create a constructive middle, create a dialogue. My sense is people tend to shout when they feel like they're not being listened to. If we, as business leaders, can address the big problems of society through these behavioral approaches, the, the hows as compared to the whats, I think we can make us all better. I think it's also interesting because what we're learning, too, is more and more, especially with the generation now, Gen Z, graduating from college right now, millennials slightly ahead of them, they want to work for companies that lead with their values. And they're not gonna compromise on that. So, and obviously, it's not just those generations, it's you know, other generations as well, but if you want to have the best people in your organization, talent, you have to, you have to be doing this. Otherwise, you're not gonna get the best talent. And I think this next generation is going to be extraordinarily powerful in terms of their ideas, because this is, they care more about this than any other generation before them. They are not going to accept that climate change is going to ruin the planet. They are going to be part of that solution. And so we look at it as a really exciting time to bring new ideas and new young talent into the organization. And it's very important for engagement. They want to, they want to stay. They want to be part of it because of that. You know, and that, that goes to this concept of diversity, which is another four-hour conversation. But I would say this, diversity isn't just about gender and race, it's about sexual orientation and religion and age and income and all kinds of stuff, all the wonderful ways that we are different and yet alike. Diversity is not an end of itself. As you said, what you really want is diversity of judgment, of experience, of context, of skill. Diversity on one side enables diversity on the other. And that's what we have to nurture as leaders. And inclusion. I, 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 that's what I would say. I can't. I mean, I, I, would, I would agree with all that. And, and it, you know, we, we talk about diversity and inclusion. And they become buzzwords, you know, after a while. And I remember we had a discussion. Someone on the court, they want to shorten it to DNI. We're going to DNI. I'm like, no, we're not going to DNI. <laughs> and and actually, what we talk about at General Mills is as a culture of belonging. Because you show me a place where people feel like they can belong, I will show you a place where people feel better about what they do, they'll feel better about the company, they'll give more, they'll give their ideas. And you know, a company that can foster a culture of belonging gets the best out of people from a variety of different perspectives. And when you're leading change in a dynamic environment, not only dynamic within our companies, but dynamic within the country and dynamic within the world, and General Mills is a global company, when you have all this change going on, you better have everybody bring their best every day. And the only way you can do that is to create an environment where people feel safe to contribute and they feel like their voice is gonna be heard because it's not enough to have a seat at the table. You have to be able to have your voice heard once you get there. I, I would love to keep going in depth, but I wanna open it up to the audience because I know you'll have some tough questions. So I guess I will, I will moderate the, the asking who gets, all right, you in the front. Uh, my question's for Tom. Tom, my question's for you. Yes, sir. And, when you close a coal plant yep. in, in a town that you spoke of, uh, is there uh, the possibilities of, instead of eliminating that, converting it to either building large solar, building wind farms, continuing to keep high quality jobs and, and, and continue to support the neighborhood, at the same time progressing into uh, a lower carbon dynamic across the board? 
is that, does that work? And because I'm from California and I, and I you know, I, I think like a Californian and I'm not going to <laughs> um, put that up or down. I'm just gonna say that, you know, what I see where middle America has been ignored is when we close these plants, I, I've been making the argument with my friends and I've written my congressman and said, look it, we need to create, I'm sorry I disagreed, I'm, I'm a successful businessman, the corporate tax change benefited me to some degree. And, but I will say that um, what I felt was wrong with that was that if we had created um, a, a tax credit for building a factory in an area where unemployment was twice the national average and then gave a tax credit for training labor, which would have been maybe 50% the first year, 40, 30, 20, 10, zero. And at that point, we would have put quality jobs. We would have encouraged production within our own country. We would have, at the same time, we could do the same thing with R&D, which we did in the 60s very much, which expanded technology tremendously at Microsoft and others. How do you see that? I mean. Uh, amen. So uh, we work with the political leaders. There's a process just to pick out Georgia, since that's the example we used. Process in Georgia called an integrated resource plan, and it deals with 20 years worth of planning for both uh, generating assets as well as transmission assets. That's really an iterative solution. And uh, we work with our regulator, we work with the politicians to develop a, a best holistic answer. There's really cool ideas about that too. Uh, let me just add, internally, through this giant transformation from 70% coal to 26% coal, we have saved every job that somebody wanted to keep. In other words, if they wanted a job, we found a place for them. So there were no layoffs, okay? We made that commitment. That took some financial pain for us but we were able to manage it. Um, the other thing was we were able to work with the communities that were impacted and try to uh, develop alternative solutions like solar, like perhaps a new gas plant, like something, I don't know, but we worked with it. Um, the other thing that we do is blend into that. So we have these gigantic foundations at each of our companies. I think Georgia Power Foundation is $160 million. They're, annual volunteerism is around 250,000 hours. It's an expectation to be involved in the community. So we'll make special efforts over time to help bridge these very damaging kind of circumstances. We really do try to take a holistic approach. And I would argue we've got a terrific relationship with our regulator and with the governments that, that we serve to help make it as good as it possibly can be. It actually creates opportunity for a lot of people. One more concept I'll just throw at you. This industry has been built on reliability as a concept for so long. When I think about the potential existential threats like cyber attacks on this industry, uh, where the bad guys want to take out the grids and the whole thing, we are now transitioning, and we had it in the first time in this integrated resource plan in Georgia, the concept of resilience. If reliability is how my system operates under normal conditions, resilience is how my system operates under abnormal conditions. Hurricanes, snowstorms, cyber attacks. They're really creative ideas. Instead of closing down a coal plant, maybe we take it out of what we call economic dispatch and keep it alive only for times of emergency. So maybe those are ideas we should start uh, creating. We're spreading those things around now. I want to make sure we spread the questions out. So for the moment, a question for Jeff or Nancy. All right, right here. I have a question for Nancy. I don't think we're supposed to lecture the people on the, on the panel. Uh, I was gonna ask you, how do your sales per square foot run up against Lululemon, and what is the difference of your price point between your product against Lululemon? So we don't disclose that. Um, <laughs> but I will tell you, the, the, the percentage um, is we're about 15 to 20% lower in our average price, and that varies product by product, but we don't disclose dollars per square foot. 
Question for but Jeff. But we're very, very productive. Is there a question for Jeff? <laughs> question for Jeff? Okay, yes, question for Jeff. Jeff, you'll be pleased to know that in the session earlier this morning on rural America, <clears throat> General Mills was brought out as a good example of working with farmers. Excellent. The center piece of the conversation, though, was about the economics of family farms in that part of the conversation. And I'm kind of curious what you're finding as we kind of raise concerns about whether or not farmers are actually being paid sufficiently for the work that they are doing to transform processes. Yeah, so, happen? well, I'm, I'm glad it was brought up in a positive light. And, you know, look, the many farmers are struggling for a whole variety of reasons, and whether it's what's going on with with trade and uncertainty about trade or the changing environment, and you have too little rain or too much rain. This is why this regener idea of regenerative agriculture is so important because um, it's important for a company like General Mills, but it's important for farmers. And farmer, many farmers are really struggling, um, especially here in the U.S., and the, the key is to help them make them more profitable. And because if they're not successful, then the rest of the food chain is not going to be successful. And it can't be, it can't be a, a, a piece where some, some parts of the food chain are winning and some are losing. Everybody has to, has to have a win. And, so, and we believe in that. We believe in a collective win. And the idea of regenerative agriculture is really important because it, it makes farming more resilient. And ultimately, that should make farming more profitable. And as the climate is changing, and, and, and yes, it's changing, um, we need to make sure that we're changing our practices along with it so that everybody can be successful. Because General Mills can succeed in the short term without having farmers succeed, but we can't in the long run. And neither can consumers, and neither can the places who are selling food. All right, now it can be a question for anyone. Hands. All right, in the pink shirt. May I offer you a quick suggestion? Leaders of companies need to be able to communicate their, their missions in, in a simple way. And Tom said, honor the past, build the future. I was the vice president of Xerox Corporation in the late 60s and 70s. The CEO of, of Xerox that built the exploding copier industry said, what you are doing, do good and make a buck at it. <laughs> yeah. I there like you it. go. I'm all for that, my friend. <laughs> all right. Back, Is that copyrighted? Back there. <laughs> <laughs> have it. Have it. Those must have been, you have some good stories to tell, I'm quite People, sure. planet, and profit are not <laughs> in conflict. Okay, in the back corner with the striped shirt. Then I'm going to go back there. Thank you. Hi, Tom. I'm a, full disclosure, I'm on the board of First Solar, so thanks for all you're doing on the solar. Oh, front. listen, First Solar is uh, a terrific yeah. company. Um, a question about uh, this larger sense of corporate citizenship that you yep. alluded to. You know, you're, I was a longtime member of the Business Roundtable, and I know you are as well. Uh, one of the issues that they've always wrestled with is, you know, is our, is our role to be thinking about the shareholder and stay very focused, or is there this larger idea that business as a part of the stewards of our society should collectively be thinking about this idea of citizenship, yeah. particularly in an age where the political system's broken? And so, and then, so one argument is, well, that's not really my problem. Someone else will get to that. Or is there a role for business to play a a greater active thing in helping break, you know, fix the broken system. Thanks for that. I, there absolutely is a role. I use this uh, metaphor of there are three kinds of companies, birds of prey, moving prey, and roadkill. <laughs> uh, and it really deals with your long-term kind of enterprise orientation. In other words, if you are a company that always thinks about the enterprise impact, not just your parochial impact, and the long term, and you tend to make short term work, you're a bird of prey. Those of us that, those of you, those of them, that lose their ethics particularly, or can't make anything work, that's roadkill. Think Enron. And then I think there are a whole lot of companies in the middle that chase quarterly profits and they think parochially without the sense of the greater good. That's moving prey. And they will go one way or the other. We always have to have a sensibility. You don't measure your impact as a human being by your income statement. You measure your impact as a human being really by others. It's never about you. It's about them. Expressing your corporate sustainability that way is really the way that I think we as business leaders can make America better. And that's what we need right now. 
Well, I think, can I, can I build on that? Yeah, I know sure. Your question. You know, the idea of doing right by shareholders and doing right by the environment and society and the people who work for your company is a false choice. And uh, I mean, General Mills has paid a dividend for, for 100 years in a row. And um, you think, well, what, what about those, all those shareholders, those rich people who live in penthouses in New York? Well, you know what? They happen to be teachers unions and firefighters and people on government pensions. That's who's buying our stock. And you know, if, if we're not making any money, those people are not being successful, point one. The second is, if you're going to be around 150 years, you better do pretty well by your employees, and you better treat the world with care. Because if we're growing oats and wheat and all kinds of other things, and you're not taking care of the soil, or you're at least not helping it work, you know, 50 years from now, your shareholders certainly aren't going to be very happy when you can't grow anything. And so it's not always easy, and I don't want to paint the picture of easy, but this, there's a false choice and a false narrative right now in the U.S. That, that shareholder interests and somehow the interests of the environment and interest in employees are fundamentally different. And, and for the long run, they are not. And, me, they, and they're inextricably tied. And picking up one more concept there. There's an, in, our, in our industry, there's this emerging concept of energy justice. 47% of the families we serve in the Southeast make less than $40,000 a year. Their household discretionary income is really limited. Their energy budget as a percent of that disposable income is really high. When we say that our obligation is to, is to be clean, safe, reliable, and affordable, that is an and statement. And it has such a foundational impact on everybody we touch. It is important to keep that balance point in mind. All right, one last question, and it's gonna be, gotta be quick because we're winding down the clock and Aspen runs a tight ship. All right, we'll go there, we'll go with the blue. It's coming to you. All right, question for Jeff. Um, you said earlier that there would be major changes, you see major changes in, in distribution, in food. Uh, I think that's kind of what you Give us just a sense of what that means. Uh, is it an, as simple as Amazon moving your food, you know, uh, your products or just different channels or whatever? Yeah, sure, I think well, over the next, for, first in, in the food industry over the next, in the next decade, we're gonna see technology really change the landscape and it, it will change um, how, we, how we reach consumers, how we reach the people we serve. Um, it'll, it'll change how we do it, work our internal operations. So think um, artificial intelligence and things like that. And it'll change how food is delivered. With regard how, to how food is delivered, it's gonna be kind of conquering that last mile of delivery. And you know, whether, it, whether it's an Amazon or whether it's Walmart or whether it's done through, through Lyft or somebody else, the, or Uber Eats or whoever it is, that the, the way that food is ultimately delivered to consumers is gonna change as technology changes. And uh, whether it's applications or whether it's self-driving vehicles or whatever, that is going to be one of the biggest forces for change in our industry over the next decade. So the question is, as a CPG manufacturer, are we going to be delivering food ourselves or go through others? I suspect that although we may do some ourselves, the vast majority is going to go through somebody else because it can be done a lot more efficiently and effectively. And you know, our, um, our, we, our, for General Mills, our competitive advantage is creating, is creating food that people love and creating brands that people love. That's our competitive advantage. It's not exactly how to deliver the last mile, and that's what we stay focused on. All right, I'm going to wind down and thank our panelists for an excellent conversation.